This year has gone by really quickly and it feels like a lot has happened, but at the same time, it feels like not much has changed. But what has changed is that I've read some books. So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video, I'll score the different science books I've read this year and provide a brief overview. So the first science book I read this year was Being Mortal, Illness, Medicine and What Matters in the End by Atul Gwande. Atul was a surgeon at the Brigham and Women's Hospital as well as an author and here he recounts a modern experience of mortality, what it's like to get old and die, how medicine has improved things but also how it hasn't. This book made me feel uncomfortable at times but was also heartwarming and somewhat reassuring. He begins by providing an understanding of what happens as we age beyond a pure scientific definition but instead to a more personal and emotional one, frankly the loss of independence. Atul then raises the obvious question of who will then look after the elderly. Whilst this book is far better at addressing the problems than finding solutions, he does go on to discuss strategies to regain independence. And effectively this comes down to switching boredom with spontaneity, loneliness with companionship and helplessness with responsibility for another being. Atul also argues for a wider adoption for interpretive doctors, doctors who ask patients what they want, what is most important to them, and then makes decisions about the best treatment options, instead of being in complete control or giving all the control to the patients. And so given the changing demographics, this book is not only timely, but hopefully will motivate more discussions on how we should act. And I did make a video summarising this book, and so yeah, generally I would recommend it. Next up is The Longevity Diet by Volta Longo. This book describes a diet for longevity based on what Volta describes as the pillars of longevity. This includes basic research, epidemiology studies, clinical trials, centenarian studies and models of complex systems. He then discusses the fasting mimicking diet and touches on the proposed mechanism for how this diet is thought to be beneficial. Whilst an interesting and enjoyable read, the reason for the slightly lower score is that a good chunk of the book discusses the components of the diet and other sections I found to be a little bit repetitive. The next book I read was Bad Blood by John Carey Rue. This book is much different to the others I've discussed so far, and by that I mean it's from more of a journalistic perspective. Bad Blood is a demonstration of why I'm shocked by how much detail the author knows about the actual story. This is similar to The Codebreaker by Walter Isaacson, which I was going to mention in more detail, but I only got halfway through the book before misplacing it, and I haven't finished it yet but what I had read was very good. Anyway, back to Bad Blood. The way this book was written, I was genuinely gripped. Like, one day I could definitely see some Netflix drama being made on it. I knew very little about Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes before reading this book, and now having read the backstory of how it all unfolded, I can't tell if it's put me off trying to ever develop a biotech company, or whether it's provided the perfect example of how not to run a biotech company. If you don't know about Theranos, then to cut a long, still continuing story short, Theranos was a company that claimed to have developed a blood test that could diagnose for various conditions from only a pinprick of blood. These claims have since been proven false. Also, I now think I understand why I got many concerning looks when I've described to friends and family before my interest in personal diagnostics and blood tests. So yeah, but uh, more from the point, this is a genuinely a really good book and I highly recommend it. Next I read What is Life by Paul Nurse. This is a very short and succinct tale to some of the core concepts in biology. For me, this book covered much of what I already know, but for anyone who hasn't done a degree in biology, or wants an easy read into the backstories of some of the early discoveries in biology, including of course the tale of how Paul Nurse discovered some key components of the cell cycle, then you need to check out this book. The next book I read was Factfulness by Hans Rowling. Now, I was unsure whether to really include this book, but I think if you're a scientist, you should read it, but also if you're not a scientist. The essence of what this book is trying to convey is that you should be careful what data you see on the internet without fully understanding what the data is showing. In many ways, this book is optimistic. It makes you realise that many things are better than you thought, and that the negative news is always more widespread than the celebration of small successes. If I had to criticise, I would say this book is far longer than it needed to be, but otherwise was enjoyable. Then I read Ageless by Andrew Steele. This comes across as an unbiased overview of the ageing field. The book is heavily researched and written in an easy to understand manner. 
And although it provides your classic intro to longevity, it also provides the latest knowledge regarding where we're at in terms of therapeutic treatments. I learned some new things too, which is always good. And I recently spoke with Andrew and the interview will drop shortly. Then I read The Science and Technology of Growing Young. Similarly to Ageless, this book by Sergey Young provides a similar overview to the ageing field, this time with a stronger look at the convergence with technological progress. I guess the clue was in the title of the book. Sergey also splits the book into the near future of longevity interventions and the far future. And so if you're keen to hear predictions for what the future world of health will look like, then check this book out. I also spoke with the author quite intensively about it, so I suggest you watch that video as well if you're interested. And then lastly, I read Countdown by Dr. Shana Swan, a scientist based at the Mount Sinai Medical Center and one of the world's leading reproductive epidemiologists. As the title suggests, Countdown tells the tale of fertility count, not just sperm count and the current 1% yearly decline, but also female fertility, and ultimately how the chemicals and lifestyles we lead have changed human sexuality and is now endangering fertility on a far scale, such that, to quote from the book, an argument could be made that Homo sapiens already fit the standard for an endangered species. Now, I've only just finished reading the book, and I have to say, I'm quite scared. One of the most striking statistics is the somewhat lack of awareness and the funding for the research. It is often commented on how the National Institutes of Health dedicates most of the funding to cancer, neurodegenerative and cardiovascular diseases, with only a small percentage going to the National Institute on Aging, but none of the funding goes to reproductive research. You can expect in the new year more videos from me on this topic, as I feel the urge to even enter this research field myself to ensure that we can find ways to enable safe and more natural fertilisation and to improve the health of developing embryos. So frankly, I'm quite proud of myself for the books I've managed to read this year. This of course isn't every single book I read this year as I've excluded the fiction books, but I hope to read even more science books next year, hopefully more non-biological books too. So any book recommendations, please leave them in the comments. So with that, hope you've enjoyed this video. Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.